everyone, Professor David Stuckler here. I, we have a tremendously exciting session lined up for you today. I'm really excited, been preparing this for a while. And as you can see, we have Verne joining us here in the studio today. Hey, Verne, good to have you on. Um, and uh, we're gonna tell you Verne's story. We're gonna share with you what Verne has been through because it is no exaggeration that I think Verne has maybe had all the odds stacked against her was on the verge of throwing in the towel, um, had faced academic bullying, a, a, a terrible relationship with her academic supervisor, um, was given a tight deadline to where if she didn't throw in the towel, she was gonna be chucked out of the program. And she has three kids, huge family commitments. And I mean, I'm getting overwhelmed even just thinking about it. And it's just, it, it feels like it's a miracle, but it's a miracle that I see happening uh, time and time again. And uh, Renee, just so pleased to have you on that you can share your story. So uh, guys, uh, some of you are joining us here at Fast Track for the first time. And this community really is about helping you do the things that you need to do to thrive as a graduate student. I see so many grads come to me in a panic, back against the wall, uh, in a position like Renee, ready to throw in the towel, believing they're not good enough, that they can't do it. And I created this community to help you because I had a tough ride myself as a grad. And I created this community to give you the support that I wish I would have had back then. So uh, with that, I want to dive straight over to Verne. So Verne, just kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, who, so I mean, some people can get to know you, uh, who you are. I know you're, you're in Australia. It's 5.30 in, in the morning. So very early on a Saturday, no less. So really, thanks for joining us. Um, you yeah, Verne, just give it some, some background. Tell us a bit. Uh, yeah, I think nine, it was nine months ago now. Just, yeah, right, take us from the beginning. Yeah, nine months ago. So basically I did a PhD. I was based in Cambodia for five years and Colombia um, for three years. So I had an enormous amount of data collected. I was working on the Mekong Irrawaddy dolphins that are on the verge of extinction um, and just did a massive project. I'm a veterinarian. That's my basic degree, but I've also studied epidemiology, so I just collected data from every aspect from these dolphins and try to put it together as a PhD project. So huge, huge project. And I put together what I thought was a, a reasonably good thesis and submitted it to my um, professor, who's my head supervisor. And basically he said to me it wasn't worthy of um, submitting and he was going to drop me. He actually said to me he wanted to drop me at that stage and that if I wanted to, I could go it alone, um, but he's not endorsing my thesis. So that that's where I was pretty much where I, when I met you. Wait, so nine months ago, you were, you, your supervisor was saying, like, that's it, we're done, I can't, can't do this anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Basically, yeah, how, did, how did you feel uh, back back then? It's been nine months ago, so I'm even retracing, trying to, re to remember. Yeah, how did I mean? That's pretty tough when you think I've, I've collected this data, I've done such good work, and then you're like, yeah, your your supervisor is just saying, hey, "Wait a second, no, this is this is rubbish, this is garbage. I, I can't work with you anymore." Yeah, absolutely. After dedicating so much of my life to this project, and and I knew I had good stuff. I knew the data was amazing. I knew I had a had a really solid project um, at that stage, but I didn't actually realize I hadn't put it together really well. And I'm a I'm a pretty private student because I've had academic bullying. I don't share my work with other people um, anymore, so I hadn't been sharing my chapters with my supervisor. So pretty much what I handed him was a complete thesis. I hadn't been getting reviews of each individual chapters. And so when he saw the whole thesis, firstly, it was way too big. I had a hundred thousand words cause that was the limit. And so I went right to the limit and yeah, I hadn't been writing my chapters correctly. So it was in um, a style that was okay for a master's and okay for a honours project, but certainly wasn't acceptable as a PhD project. But I'd never been shown how to write correctly for a PhD. So I had no idea at that stage that the only problem with my thesis was the actual writing style. I thought, and I actually said to him, I said, is it the whole thesis? Is it my content? What is it? Um, and he didn't give me a direct answer at that stage, but he did indicate that there was some hope with my data. So that's pretty much when I got involved with you and we started looking at my um, chapters individually and then you started guiding me how to write and 
pretty much all it really was, seriously, was a change in writing style. All I had to do was rewrite each chapter so it made sense to him. I was using the exact same content but writing it in an academic voice that he understood. Oh, we seem to have frozen. Are you still there? I'll keep talking just in case that you're there and you've just got a, a glitch at the moment. Um, so one of the problems that I had when I first met Professor was Professor David was I'd been bullied by um, quite a lot of academics that had tried to come over to Cambodia and take over my project, which they actually have done. And they've spent the last um, 10 years working on my project. And so I didn't trust anybody. So it was really difficult when I met um, Professor David to actually trust him and give him my work to make sure he wasn't going to um, steal my data and try and publish my work as well. So there was a real trust issue when I first met um, Professor David and so I had to overcome that barrier as well but I'm so glad I did I'm glad I'm tr I trusted him I watched all his videos saw what he was about and thought he's a real genuine guy he's really going to help me and so I just decided to go in and work with him I think we seem to have lost the professor, so I'm not sure where he's gone. So if we've lost him, I might just keep talking um, until he's back. So basically my work in Cam Cambodia, I had um, 46 academics that came over, um, saw what a great, great project it was, saw the amount of data that we'd collected, um, I tried to discredit me at the time, took all my data and reviewed it. And basically um, two to three years later, came to very similar con conclusions as myself, but it took them a long time. By that stage, um, basically, um, hi, you're back again. Hey, hey, hey I'm back. I'm, I'm not really sure that's the first time it's happened. Uh, you know what? We were talking earlier that it's uh, Friday the 13th here, but not over <laughs> there. And it, it, it came back to haunt us. So, uh, uh, there we are. Let me just make sure everybody's back on, on the stream, Vern. Um, yeah, looks looks like we're still uh, looks like we're still going. So that that's fantastic. Okay, Vern, where where were you in this story? I I wanted you to be able to tell your story. So uh, there we are. Um, where did you get to? I kept talking, so I'm hoping it just kept live streaming because um, yeah. I think you were having an issue on your side, so I just kept going. Um, so I was just basically at this stage just saying um, how I really struggled to trust trust you in the beginning because I had so many, I had 46 academics that had come over and basically stolen my project from me in Cambodia. Yeah. Um, and at that stage when they came to Cambodia, they firstly they came on the, the premise that they were basically there to help me. And so stupid me I handed them all my data and they said they were going to review all my data and just make sure that I was on the right track but what they ended up doing was taking all my data and saying I'm completely wrong and um, basically I had a whole range of things that were contributing to killing the dolphins and they said it's nothing it's none of those things it's only gill nets and they were very very black and white with their thinking and so they yeah. took all my data my necropsy data my photographs everything that I'd ever done my toxicology data um, and they reanalyzed it themselves and some of them went off to actually publish my data and yeah. I mean yeah. as yeah, as using my own you know case numbers they didn't even change my case numbers in the in the paper so you know I really I really struggled with academics from all angles with this project and so when I came to you, I had real trust issues because I was like, who are you? Am I really going to give you some of my stuff to look at? This stuff is, you know, if you take this stuff, this is my whole PhD and I could potentially lose my whole PhD. So I was yeah. really, really scared when I started working with you. 
And I, 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 re I remember that. I remember that. You thought I might have been like an inside spy for <laughs> for this group. Because you knew you had these pearls. I think a lot of students are like, I've collected all this valuable data. And yeah, somebody's out, out to get me because it's really felt like people in the university are out out to get you. And uh, yeah, that's been a horrible experience of, of deep distrust. How did we... Uh, you've got to take me back nine months because uh, how did we get, how did we get through, how did you start to trust me? Um, because you, I mean, you've seen I published hundreds of papers and. Um, That's it. Yeah. You, yeah, you said to me, like, I've published over 350 papers. I have no interest in stealing your data. That's not why I'm here. Um, you really made me felt like feel at ease and we did a few sessions together. Um, and then I saw the value in what we were doing, you know, just the one on one group work and I was actually making progress and things started to turn around with my supervisor and things actually started to progress. And there was a real invested interest in in you progressing me and getting me over the line as opposed to all these other academics that were really trying to, um, for lack of a better word, just yeah. screw me over. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was there any, you know, I, I do feel like there were some moments, Verne, where it just kind of started to snap into place. Like it just almost an aha moment where you almost, we got to, but you didn't even need me anymore because you started to feel good. I mean, what was that like working together? And what, did you feel it yourself? You had some breakthrough moments? Yeah, there was, um, I mean, as I said, like I'd finished my whole thesis. So I was working on a massive document. I had 10 chapters at the time. So it was huge. It was um, about 600 pages. And what you started to do with, was work individually, chapter by chapter. And then you said to me, let's just get one single chapter over the line. Let's get one chapter so we know exactly what your supervisor's after. And then once we've got that, that's like our template for all the others. And I think that was that was one of those moments because I said, OK, well, let's do that. Let's focus on one single chapter. And so we pieced the one chapter together. And really, it was just um, I was going through all your other videos. I was going through your videos on your peer writing structure. Like that was crucial, just learning how to write in that writing style. So I always had a topic sentence, which I realized I hadn't. I had chunks of information. Um, um, it was also giving me a, my own critical academic voice. By, by following your peer structure, I suddenly had my own voice instead of having wads of information from different papers, basically using other papers as my academic voice, which was how I'd structured my writing um, initially. And I think that's just, again, it's not having your own confidence as, no. as an academic. So you take other people's ideas, which is what you're thinking, but they've said it, so therefore it must be right. And you've used their ideas to build your story. And using your peer writing structure, I was able to go, okay, well, these are all the ideas that I've got for this paragraph, and this is why, and explain it. And instead, I was citing just referencing papers rather than having their text and suddenly I had my own voice and I think that was yeah. that was a key thing to changing my my writing style but also having the guidance that you gave me of building a house and knowing that the whole structure had to be be there you needed a solid foundation you needed all your windows doors everything in the right place like if you had all these components but they were in the wrong place then it didn't make sense to anybody else and i think once mm -hmm. that once i realized that that component was that i actually had all the key ingredients for my house i just had them in the wrong places and i started structuring mm -hmm. my chapters correctly and writing with your peer style the chapter just came together it was yeah. just perfect and suddenly yeah. And, and what happened, yeah, I mean, really, I, I love the way you said that, that kind of your voice had gotten lost somehow through all of it. And it, it was amazing because it was like you found your voice, you could write your chapter. And I remember when you went back to your supervisor, yeah, what happened then when you, because I remember you had some back and forth then at that stage. How did, how did that start to go and how did that start to change that relationship? Um, it really w went quite positive because after that, when he started seeing me write in his style and he could understand it, and that's what you had said to me, you said he's so used to reading journals and he's so meticulous and pedantic that he's looking for something of the utmost quality. So let's write journal quality for him and that, that way he'll be able to understand the language. And so we wrote everything as though it was journal quality and suddenly the feedback was amazing. And 
we actually started becoming friends. He started taking an interest in my life and, you know, what happened in Cambodia and what was happening in my life in Australia and asking about my kids. And we actually started becoming friends as well. And the feedback was um, changed from being completely negative to being um, positive and you know, he was actually now starting to build me up and make my my chapters better instead of knocking me down. And so it was a complete changing moment, really. Yeah, yeah. I I, I remember seeing the the feedback as well, and it it was almost as though he hadn't been bothering to read anything, and then suddenly you were getting he was treating you like a prize student and investing time, energy, and making really constructive improvements. Um, and yeah, it was amazing because I think, I think part of what happened is he, I don't think he fully understand uh, or understood at that point, all the richness of what you had to say, because it was a bit, the way it was kind of smushed together, it, it was hard for others to follow all the great stuff that you had done in, in your research. And once he saw that, it's, it felt like it's like a, a, a light bulb went, went off and, and a switch, it really, no exaggeration, like a switch got flipped. Um, Absolutely. Like watching your video on how to structure um, a paper, I wrote down pages and pages of notes and said, okay, these are the things. And, you know, just from your introduction paragraph to listing those key findings to talking about your limitations, you know, I used to try and hide my limitations because I, I didn't want people to know, oh, yeah, of course that that's a limitation, but I don't want to bring it to their attention, whereas yeah. you – you know, bring it to the forefront, put it on the table, let them know you absolutely know that that's a limitation and how you addressed it. And I think just having that complete transparency and that complete honesty um, also made a huge difference. And suddenly, although I knew what the key points were, my readers didn't. And so just bringing them to the forefront, like I used lists all the way through my, my thesis. So firstly, secondly, thirdly, yeah. finally you know the whole way through so there's absolutely no way my reader would not know what my key points are and what I'm discussing and yeah. quite often I would list those key points in a paragraph and then go on to to talk about each of those key points individually but just having that structure initially so that you know you're getting the right stuff across because a lot of stuff there was a lot of um, superfluous information that I had there which in my head was great and it made the case stronger for me to understand so I knew I was on the right track. But it's information that was really irrelevant to my thesis and once we cut it out, um, it didn't make my thesis any less strong just because that um, superfluous information was gone. But it's information, background information that I needed to be able to understand the data and understand why I had the conviction to say this is what was happening. Yeah, you know what, I think I see this happen with a lot of students that they've collected the data and they know the data and all its messiness. And so it almost feels like every detail is important, but it's almost sometimes it just takes a little bit of an external eye to step back and say, okay, let's get the big picture. What are the main findings? What, now that you know that, you looked at all this messiness, you know the main findings, what are the essential ingredients we need to bring these points to the surface? Because with all that detail, we those big points were getting lost, and so yeah, I found that I I was I found it so much easier to understand. I also feel like you kind of because um, you had been going at it for so many years, almost started to lose sight of of that bigger picture and the, some of the bigger messages. Is, is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Like I had to work real hard to pull out the key things and and separate the key findings from these little bits of detail that I thought were so important. And I think as a PhD student, you do. You read so much information and you start thinking that everything you read is so important. And it is because in your head, it builds the big picture. And you don't have to have all that detail in your thesis. As long as you've built the big picture in your head and you know why you're saying what you're saying and you can back it up if you need to, you know, if you're in a an academic discussion and someone saying, well, I really disagree with why you've come to that conclusion, then you've got all that information in your head and you can, you know, use that in, in an argument. But your PhD is not the place to bring out every single little detail, you know, to use 25 papers to validate a single point that you're making. And that was, yeah. that was the changing yeah. point was that I had so much information and I really had to start skimming it down. And actually at the end of the day, it felt like I was dumbing down my PhD. PhD. You know, I was making it a, a lot more simplified than what I had written in the first place. Um, 
and it made it so much easier to follow. It made it easier for my supervisor to follow. It made it easier for me to follow my own thesis and know what my main points were. And it really made it easier right at the end to summarise my PhD in a nutshell as well because I'd really brought out all these main points and I could bring that back to the abstract, I could bring that back into the final discussion. And so it really did tie up nicely. Once I followed your structure, um, and that that structure guide is absolutely essential. Like if anyone just reads or watches one of your videos, that would be the one that would guide them how to write correctly. Which one? The one on uh, writing up, Renee? The, yeah, yeah. Those are uh, exactly, I mean, our, our students really benefit from those templates because it, it, it sometimes uh, if they're going in circles or feeling stuck on the writing, you step back, take a breath and say, okay, this is what, this is the material that needs to go here. This needs to go there. I'm really glad you shared that. We're going to take some questions from the audience as well. I think some people can relate to exactly how you're feeling. Just to add some spice on this, I know, uh, Renee, you've got um, uh, th three kids, uh, three, three, five, and nine, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, uh, how did you balance your, and you had a, a job with 30 employees. I mean, how did you balance uh, all this together? too i mean you had a you had a lot on your plate i've had a lot on my plate so all three of my children were born during my phd so that was hectic in itself um it was not planned but i started my phd in my 30s so it's one of those natural things that just happens you suddenly go oh my gosh i put my career first and i really have to think about having a family so it just kind of happened and i've had to juggle my phd with my family um one of my biggest things is I call it sleep time so when my family's sleeping that's when I get up and work so initially I I'm always a morning person so I used to set my alarm for 3 a.m work from 3 till 7 um unfortunately with little kids they kind of during from three to seven they realize that mum's not in bed with them anymore and they come looking for me so they'd actually distract me during that time and wake up three or four times during that time. So I actually had to change my cycle around that and they got really good sleep from seven till midnight. And so I changed my work patterns according to that, put them down at seven. And I promise you, if you're a mum and you put your kids down at seven, it is so much better than putting your kids down at eight and nine. So get into the routine of putting your kids down early. They don't know. So just, just do it seven o'clock bedtime. Um, I I helped by getting melatonin gummies and so my kids would have a beautiful sleep. I knew I had a good solid few hours to work and that was my productive time. So I worked from seven to 12 pretty much every night. I'd set my alarm at 12 so that I knew that I had to stop at that time because as any PhD student knows, um, once you're in the moment and you're working, you can just keep working and then you yeah. burn yourself. So I had an alarm that um, went every single night at 12 o'clock to say, hey, time's up and occasionally I'd stay on to one o'clock but most times when I heard my alarm I went okay I've got to start wrapping up oh, what I'm working oh good on. you know every day we just did last Friday was a session just on burnout and timers and having stopping points because when you get in the flow and you love what you do it's so easy to get carried away and then you just crash and wreck yourself for the next few days um yeah, yeah. let me, me kind of ask with family was um I remember I mean look nine months ago I mean I remember when you came to me even just talking about the thesis uh there's one point where uh you were in tears and you're just really on really sinking i mean did it take a toll on your family and, and relationships in that time uh, it's kind of it, as i know it can be really hard to separate i mean uh, what was that like then well, first thing, I mean, I've sacrificed so much for my PhD, you know, so my family have been through so much me doing this and then to have it just about taken away from me and me to hit rock bottom like that and feel like I've wasted all this time for nothing. My family have suffered for nothing. Um, it was, it was a real rock bottom moment. Like it was devastating. And then, you know, I got back in the zone, started working with you and I had a deadline and I said to my family, like, this is this is going to end. I promise you, this is the last leg. I'm going to put everything into this. Um, I did things with my children called their 10 minutes and each of my child children could basically come to me and say, mum, I want my 10 minutes. And I had to stop everything I was doing and give them 10 minutes of their time, unconditional, whatever they wanted to do. And often it was just playing a little game with them, playing shop with my daughter. But it was their 10 minutes where I wasn't yelling at them that I was doing my PhD or go away, I'm writing or 
locking my study door. It was bare 10 minutes. And that 10 minutes was quality 10 minutes. And it really, really helped in that last leg, that six months where I was absolutely working myself to the bone and really pushing myself to get the deadline happen, you know, to make that deadline. Um, that saved my children, just having that little moment. And then the other thing that I did was at least every, probably every four, four to five weeks, we'd go away for a weekend. Mm. And I wouldn't, most times I wouldn't take my PhD. Towards the end, I started taking my computer with me and working through the night, even on holiday. But um, it was just, it was a reset. It was a reset for me that was so important. We'd go away, we'd swim, we'd do water rides, we'd do whatever. It was family time. They got a bit of me and I got a break. And quite often what I found was whatever I was stuck on before the weekend away, when I came back, it just suddenly fell into place and so I'd been working um, non-productively let's say for a week or two on a problem and as soon as I got back from this weekend it took me like 10 minutes and I solved the problem so to me it was actually essential taking these little breaks and it was just my way of recharging my way of not burning out and my way of keeping my family happy um, so that I was giving them a bit of quality time in between all this crazy dedication to my PhD. But, uh, that's I'm Look, I mean, I, I would say you're so inspiring, but uh, other people in the group are saying you're so inspiring, Renee, and uh, awesome story. And it's really true. I, I mean, you've said before, Renee, that like if you could do it, you feel like anybody can do it. Uh, and I feel like 100%. I mean, you just had I, so many odds stacked against you. I just run back through it. And supervisor was going to throw in the towel if you did it. You had academic bullying, people stealing your data, massively challenges with family and work to balance, super tight deadline, and and just feeling down and lost, like you couldn't find your voice. Um, yeah, tell, tell us. Yeah, I, I cut you off. What were you going to say, Renee? <laughs> One of the other things that I learned in this journey, like I was quite devastated with all these academics, you know, trying to steal my data and um, even publishing, like there's papers published on my data. And I was absolutely, absolutely devastated. Like one of the papers came out, um, you know, last year, pretty much the same time that I started working with you. And, and it was a toxicology paper that was like some of the crux of my PhD. And I was like, how could they do this? And it was a really pathetic paper. Like I read this paper and I went, oh, my God, you can tell that they don't know anything about this project because they've used little tidbits of my information, yeah. but they don't know the whole story. And so the paper's really quite weak. And I was pretty upset at the time. And then I had this moment. I went, let me use it. They saying bits of information that I want and that I've been saying all the time, but it's not a very strong paper, but it's strong enough with what they're saying for me to use that information as a credible source um, yeah. to, to, for all the academics out there. And actually, so it was a moment where I went, you know what, I'm going to use all their stuff that they've used against me, against them. And I put that in my thesis and suddenly I was building a thesis on basically what they've stolen from me and what they were saying. And it was such a great thesis. It, it gave me um, another avenue on the gap of knowledge and I was able to back up my own information based on what they were saying and what they were trying to prove afterwards. So although it was really terrible and such an awful thing to go through, it ended up being um, such a strong story because I was actually able to use their stuff against them, which instead of seeing the negative, I turned it into a positive. And so it actually made my thesis so much stronger. So if anyone's ever in this position where someone steals your data and publishes or uses stuff or tries to say stuff against you, um, use it. And especially if they've said something completely, completely wrong and you've proved the opposite, it gives such a beautiful balance to the argument. Um, and especially if they are such credible researchers as what I had, like I've got some of the top um, dolphin people in the profession that basically said I was wrong. And I've had to stand up and say, you know, some of the best scientists in history were told they were wrong, Einstein, Newton, you know, and you just have to bear that in mind, even though you're a tiny little academic researcher and you think, oh my God, you know, 46 people are telling me I'm wrong. How can, how can I still stand up there and say with conviction that I'm right? Just stand your ground. If the data speaks, the data speaks, you know. And so at the end of the day, um, yeah, that was something so valuable. I could have crawled down in a little ball and cried and 
which is what I was doing initially, or I could do what I did and turn the whole situation around and use their stuff basically against them, which was just solid, solid argument. It's so power, Renee, it's so powerful. And, and, and you can see, you hear your voice and your passion starts to come through because you know this work is so important. You know this can really make a difference to the well-being of dolphins. And you have almost that righteous rage, like these guys, they're getting it wrong. And by getting it wrong, they're, they're threatening the extinction of, of the dolphin population. And uh, I just wanted to bring in a comment because some other people have experienced this too in this community. We have a great environment of sharing ideas and giving constructive feedback coming from someone also who is worried about people stealing ideas from research at the start. I think that's a very common, common feeling. Um, and so now I know what's really important too, you're turning to publishing uh, the paper, which is fantastic to get, you know, not, you know, from, from cowering and not, not having your voice to now getting the, the, these papers out there. So yeah, tell us a bit where you're at now with everything, Brene. What's, uh, yeah, what's on the horizon? So I've probably got about eight papers that I want to publish um, from my thesis and I was so scared of publishing initially. So I've got a few papers out there ready, but I'm not the primary author and it's because I was so scared of the whole process, um, I would let other people take my data and publish um, with me as a secondary um co-author which which was really heartbreaking initially because you know you've done all this hard work but I was so scared of all these academics that had trashed me and um basically made my life a living hell for for quite a number of years and now I find myself in a different situation where I feel confident I love what I've produced in my thesis I I feel like I've got a really strong academic voice I know that I'm correct and yeah, I'm at the stage now where we're starting to get our manuscripts um, together. And because I used your writing style for my thesis, it's not a lot of um, adaptation. Like when I've been going through and looking at what I have to do for various journals, um, as long as I've got the template right, it seems so adaptable. It really doesn't matter which journal I'm going to write to. We can just switch and change a few things around. But, you know, just using that basic template now to write each paper and each of my my um, thesis chapters were structured basically as a chapter. So everyone was um, basically a standalone thesis. My thesis was basically essentially um, eight chapters, eight papers in, in a thesis. So it was quite a different way of um, presenting a thesis rather than having an introduction chapter and a methodology chapter and a discussion chapter. So that makes yeah. it really easy now for us to be able to pull out each chapter tweak it a little bit and it really didn't take me that much to tweak um the first paper that i've submitted to you on the um yeah. in our group it took a couple of days to put that together and now it's just a little bit of editing but not a hell of a lot and we're probably going to be right to start publishing our first pa paper in a few weeks yeah i i remember too at the start of that there was an initial barrier thinking oh this is going to be massively difficult to do and then when you watch some of the training videos and got into it, uh, there was another kind of aha moment like, oh, wait a second, That's, this isn't that hard. I, I can do this. Is, is, that, is, that fair, is that fair to say again, Renee? If, uh, yeah. And actually, I had another major change. So um, a couple of weeks ago when I said to you, you know what, I'm going to um, publish the chapter that's most it's the easiest chapter. It'll get approved in two seconds. It's very straightforward. There's no controversy or anything about that chapter let me just get that one done and at least I've got one published and then I sat down to do that and I went you know what that's the coward's way out let me go one of the hard chapters and the, the nuts and bolts and the crux of what I want to say because if I get that one through I can use that paper to build on the other papers that I want to um, publish and, and so I actually changed my strategy and I thought let me publish one of the harder chapters first um, and that just shows the confidence that you've given me, you know, to even be able to stand up and say, yep, I'm going to go with the hard stuff first and let's get this out there. And, you know, even the journals um, within conservation and wildlife and, um, you know, veterinary medicine, we don't have journals that have very high scores, for example. You know, six is probably as high as I've managed to find, but I'm definitely aiming at a journal that's got... Um, a higher level so and i think why not why not get our stuff done in you know a top conservation journal no absolutely i mean we we need to go for it not just for the impact factor in terms of what's your career but um to multiply the visibility of the work that you've done and uh 
I also give some hope to the population that's on the verge of going extinct. Um, I, w- I want to take a couple questions for Nay. Um, there's one, one person who's asked uh, here, thanks for this live, so informative. Can you tell me whether your PhD was quantitative, qualitative, or mixed method? Um, yeah. It was predo- it was mixed method, but it was predominantly quantitative. So I used a lot of epidemiology in my data. So um, a lot of statistics. Um, I've done quite a number of statistics courses, but I really hate statistics. Um, but I found a really good statistics package on Excel. So it was very simple. And I turned around my stats in no time and I actually became quite proficient at doing stats. And it was great because stats, um, it speaks for for your data you know once you've got it quantitatively you don't have to justify anything else because the data speaks for itself so um predominantly my phd became quantitative yeah and i know a lot of the heavy lifting in your data too was actually going out doing the necropsies of, of the dolphins and uh the analysis trying to understand why why they were dying and make the argument that it wasn't so much about the fish fishing but had to do with pollution and it's a really powerful message uh, that that in a message that you're, you're right, some people in the field don't want to hear. So you really had to have thick skin to press through that to get your message out. And I mean, Renee, would, it, 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 take us again from the beginning. It sounds like you rediscovered some of your passion for this as well. You rediscovered this is. Well, tell us a bit. Why, why is this so important to you? I mean, I, I know, but I want other people to know why why it's so important. Because this is part of it's getting the PhD and the letters after your name. But I know for you, it's so much more than that. Oh, absolutely. Like, and towards the end of my um, PhD, before I met you, I was, I, I was actually calling my PhD the monster. And I was like, I just want to get this finished. So I never have to think about those dolphins or those people that situation ever again. I was so over it. I was, I just wanted to file it away in the back of my memory and never ever think about it again. Whereas now I'm back on the forefront and I go, okay, I've done all the work. I've done the hard yards. I've done the data analysis. I know what's going on. And it's not a straightforward problem. So these these dolphins are on the verge of extinction. They've had no carbs survive for about 30 years. The lifespan of dolphins is, we're not sure exactly, but it's probably about 30 or 40 years. So there's not long left that these dolphins have and they had a tremendously hard history they've um, gone through the Khmer Rouge which was a war in Cambodia they've gone through the Vietnam War they've been bombed they've been killed they've been used for oil lanterns like these poor dolphins were used as target practice they they've really had a, a tough life and so they went from being thousands and thousands of these dolphins in the Mekong to just 85 dolphins when I got there. So the population really, really dwindled. I was called in as a vet because they had a high mortality rate of the calves. So I was called in for a year just to come in and assess what was going on with the calves. And um, one year turned into five because it was, first, you're in Cambodia, it's very corrupt. So there were times that the government would let me go and get dolphins and necropsy them. There were times where the government just said, no, you absolutely are not allowed to do a necropsy on that dolphin. So you know, some dolphins I'd get that were fresh, some dolphins I'd get that were you couldn't use. They were just, um, you know, just in, just disgusting carcasses. So over five years, I managed to do 27 necropsies, which um, so for that population is pretty large, especially if there's only 85 dolphins left. So it's yeah. a pretty sized um, data set that I managed to get. It's a hard data set to work with because it's not fresh. It's not ideal. Like in a hospital, you know, someone comes in with a tumour, you cut it out, it's fresh tissue, you get really good results back from histopathology. Not the same with these dolphins. So you, you're working under very tremendous um, difficult situations to get data from these, these dolphins. But anyway, it was, a, it was a lifelong commitment, basically, five years in Cambodia um, collecting the data. And then I looked at everything, like, um, so my basic degree is veterinary medicine. So I came from a conservation medicine perspective and decided to look at everything. So the necropsies, the toxicology, um, I teamed up with the geneticist, who's another one of my supervisors, who's absolutely amazing. And I went over to Columbia and worked in her genetics lab and learned how to do genetics, which I'd never done before, um, so that I could do the genetics on the dolphins. I did... Absolutely everything you could possibly imagine on this data set. And then I had to pull it all together. And so it wasn't a simple case of this is what's killing the dolphins or this is what's killing the dolphins. It was so many things coming together. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I call, there's a word called a causal web and it basically shows how all factors contribute together in this causal web to create what's happening. And that and that's basically the end story of the dolphins. There's so many things. It's a little bit of um, the genetics is not right because of the indiscriminate killing during the war. Um, dolphins were left that wouldn't normally mate together, but they were forced to because the population was small. So we had that going on. We've got um, toxins in the water that are knocking out their immune system. So we've got that component going on. So we've got babies being born with really high um, levels of toxins that are knocking out their immune system before they've even started. Um, the mums don't have, the mums are passing all these chemicals through in the milk. So the mums aren't doing them any favour by breastfeeding them. So there was all these components working together. The poor dolphins really just didn't stand a chance. So, and although, you know, it doesn't, it's, too late now like even my supervisor says this phd project is 10 years too late um mm. these dolphins are going to go extinct there's nothing we can do because there's such an old population now but it's such a integral um study for anyone else doing um wildlife work on any population that's on the verge of extinction like this especially when they've got high mortality rates in the young it just shows them a really good framework for what to look at, you know, and so hopefully they're not starting from scratch. They can start from, you know, a platform that I've now developed for where to go forward. And the same if we have similar situations, there's only a few freshwater populations of Irrawaddy dolphins and if they start having similar things happen in other populations, they can use they can use this data now um, as a platform to go forward. So, yes, I am. I'm so passionate now about this again because although I can't save these dolphins, I see the greater context in conservation medicine of, of saving other populations with this data. Yeah, uh, and to me it's just so important to get this message out there exactly as you say, as, as a warning of what can happen if people don't pay attention to the data uh, about what's causing these dolphins to die and suffer. And uh, uh, it is kind of heartbreaking to hear that uh, you think it may be too late now. Um, I wish you, I do wish you could have gotten these papers published five, ten years ago. Um, just on that, I mean, Renee, what would you say? I mean, looking back now, I know some people think about uh, maybe working with us or working with other uh, coaches out there, um, and, and are sometimes un, unsure about what to do. Might have those same concerns about confidentiality, and and sometimes just continue to suffer in silence. I mean, what would you say to some people who are thinking about getting more structured support and guidance? I would say 100% take the plunge. Like this was the single most important thing that I've done in my PhD. And, and I actually call it my single most important resource. So out of all the resources you're going to have in your PhD, um, this is the most valuable. If you could have this right at the beginning, you would save yourself so much um, unnecessary work, so much heartache, so much pain. I think most people would be able to finish their PhD process in the given time period if they actually had this structure to follow and know exactly what they're doing. It's, it's kind of an integral part of your PhD process that's never taught to you. There's no courses that teach you how to write like this or teach you how to bring it all together. And you need to know this. This is a fundamental skill of being able to produce your thesis. You know, all of us going through are going to have amazing data. We're going to have all the stuff that we've collected. We're all passionate while we're going through our PhD process. But when it comes to the writing stage, that's when most people give up. And it's just because we've never been shown how to write. You know, we're, we're very high achievers, obviously, being PhD students we're we're up there already so and a lot of us are perfectionists and so if it's not perfect we want to give up no. this is teaching us a way to make our project perfect but manageable instead of having this never-ending list of perfection that we never achieve and i think that that is so important it, it's following a structure just like every other course that you've probably ever done where you've you given a structure you learn that stuff you do it according to that and you you pass your course i think having um what you bring to the program is just as important you know it's a skill that nobody teaches and it is so valuable you have been the single most important thing in my phd project I mean, Verne, I can't, I can't take credit for that because you did, you did the heavy lifting of all the research. I, I just kind of came in a, a, and, and helped package it together and, and make it a bit clearer. You did the heavy lifting. So, uh, yeah, I like to think I just supported you um, from the back end. But th thanks for sharing that with everybody because uh, you've just worked so incredibly hard. You deserve the success. And 
completely turned it around. I want to take one more um, qu question here. Somebody else is saying exactly, uh, and I think this is really speaking to to members of our, our community that uh, so true. The writing stage is my major barrier. I, I'm so scared. I don't know what it is, and and the universities just expect you to figure this stuff out with with no training on it whatsoever, and you're just kind of thrown off the deep end and. As intelligent as you are, and, and I think all of you can see how intelligent Renee is, how passionate she is, um, if you don't have the right tools to succeed and really thrive, you can, you, you can end up hitting uh, rock bottom. Uh, no exaggeration here. I, I want to take one other comment here. So, uh, someone said, it's inspiring, Renee, how you ended up killing your inner demons and turning the situation around. Um, and was there anything else you did? Uh, could have been with, with my guidance or other things that that helped, helped you in that process of turning it around, the things, um, yeah, exercise routine. I, I don't know. Does anything come to mind there, Renee, that, that you did? Um, I made a timeline and I stuck to my timeline. So um, I decided, so I had six months and I decided that I was going to um, complete two chapters to completion every single month. And I got the gave the timeline to my supervisor as well and I said this is our deadline this is what we're um, working towards and I actually got it signed off by the university so I made it official and that way um, I actually had something that I had to work towards each month and I had to keep working the most important thing is work every day unless you've given yourself those weekends off those weekends off those are your weekends but every other day you work and even if you're having a day where you go I absolutely can't do anything today yeah. there's nothing I can do Fix up your references, fix up your acknowledgements, fix up your, um, you know, anything that's little. There's, you know, your acknowledgements. You've got to, I had, I don't know, five pages of acknowledgements for people that I had to thank, you know, and you, you use your brain power to just remember every single one because you don't want to forget people. So even if you're having one of those days where you think I absolutely can't do anything today, work on something like that. Look at your end note, you know, make sure everything's formatted correctly. So it just means that you're working on something absolutely every day and don't procrastinate um there's a ted talk called the procrastination procrastination or procrastination monster whatever it is called just type in ted and procrastination don't do that don't leave your thesis to the last minute like keep working and what i found was i tackled my hardest chapters first in my um timeline and that way i got the biggest ones and the hardest ones done and ticked off first and work with your supervisor don't wait and do what i did don't submit an entire thesis um work together chapter by chapter and get their feedback and that way you know straight away what level they're looking at and get one chapter over the line i think that was when we first started together and you said to me you know how many chapters do you have over the line i didn't actually even realize i had no chapters over the line at that stage i'd had one chapter reviewed and thought that was the process you just got your yeah. review and that was it was done um i had no idea that there was going to be you know you you look at 20 20 reviews backwards and forwards backwards and forwards um you know and and sometimes it's just stupid little words the first few reviews um will be hard because your supervisor will have a lot of changes right at the beginning and then with each one um, you know, and don't reinvent the wheel. Just use their comments and make it better. Use their comments, make it better. Don't add new stuff. Whatever you do, don't yeah. add new stuff. You just follow their their reviews and keep going until you prune it down to what they want. And as soon as you get to the stage where, you know, you, you're turning over your reviews in two minutes, that's when you can say, well, is this ready? And get the tick off. And it is the best feeling in the world. When your supervisor says, that chapter's thesis ready, you can file it away. Oh my goodness, like I mm -hmm. cried that just went. That was like the best feeling. Um, and I mean, to me, it was the same chapter that I'd put forward, but just edited a bit better, had a bit clearer um, information, had had commas in the right place, you know, um, and the structure was obviously a lot better because I followed the, the peer structure and the structures set out by um, Professor David. So, yeah, to me, yeah. I, I remember that feeling when you got that chapter over the line. It brought your confidence back that I can do this. That you've got, you've got yeah. this. Um, that that was yeah. huge. Yeah. At, at the beginning, Renee and I drew, drew this big, bright finish line, and I wanted, and that was our goal. Just one at a time. Don't work on all the chapters at one time. Let's optimize. Just yeah. get this one done, and then 
get in that good positive cycle. You're feeling good. You're feeling confident. And we can carry that template to the rest. That was so good. I liked what you said. Hang on about procrastination. Um, you know, I, I like setting those mini deadlines and timelines and holding yourself to it, uh, even if it's an artificial sense of pressure. Sometimes you need that, and uh, I think a lot of people relate to this. Uh, I'm such a procrastinator. I have to take your advice. And uh, you know, this, the PhD. Sometimes you don't don't even have a fixed timeline. You're just left on your own. It's not like an assignment. You got to have this assignment to. To two weeks. Some, somebody else here is saying, um, I, I pray for the day when I can experience that feeling of uh, crossing that line. It, it is it's a pretty good feeling. Um, yeah, you're going to get I'm, that feeling again when you get your paper published too. There's some of these many, many rewards along the way. And that's the other thing. When you have this huge mountain to climb, you need these kind of steps, steps that you get those pos that positive feedback that you're feeling good. Um, yeah. You were going to say something. Yeah. <laughs> By, um, a few things like at the at the beginning of each month so each month I started two chapters um, for the review the review process and I remember the first day of each month I would just go oh my god okay we got to tackle this and so because the first reviews are the hardest you know that's that's the, the bulk of your work is going to come in those first few reviews that's where you're going to get a lot of comments and a lot of things that you have to address and that was another thing i was never addressing the comments you taught me that you taught me to address every single comment with my own comment uh bubble no one had ever told me that so i was addressing comments previously by just deleting his comment and addressing it but he had no idea that i was addressing it oh, so yeah. that was a thing that changed as I well remember, so i he remember that yes yes yeah it's uh he was <laughs> because sometimes your supervisor is so busy he doesn't remember where what change you made in response to the comment and he would come back and it was kind of exponential growth of comments because you get a comment and then the next time those comments were running, you just make new comments and find new things and it was just an endless cycle. Um, and so we kind of, by, by taking control of that, you were able to say, okay, I dealt with these comments. What other comments remain? What other, and, and, and get yeah. it to that finish line. That was really I important. It was working with you like it was a feature of Word. So I used to see all the comments and see all the red and see all the different colored texts and see all the crossing out and it would just make my brain go crazy. My brain couldn't cope with it. And um, then I was working with you and you could just hide all the comments and the text away and it was the clean document. And I had never worked like that. I didn't even know that that was a feature. So, um, you know, there might be other grad students just out there just like me that can't stand all that red and all the comments and all the editing and think it just gets too much for your brain and you're ready to give up and I actually gave up on publishing a paper because it got so read with all the comments from all the peer reviewers and I never published the paper in the end and we were right there and they kept saying Vinay what's going on and this is you know five years ago and I gave up on that paper even though we were right at the end because I couldn't see through all the editing um, a simple thing is, you know, just a button on Word that takes away all that editing so you can see the final copy. And, you know, again, that was just something just working with you in those one-on-one -on -one sessions you showed me and that changed my whole ability to cope. You know, my brain works a little bit different, differently to people. I'm a bit on the spectrum. And so to me, I just had all this noise on my page that I couldn't cope yeah. with. And so if you don't know that that's a feature of Word, it can really throw you off and and yeah it did it stopped me publishing a paper that was at the final stages of peer review uh, so I, you know I, I didn't know i didn't know that had happened in the past i mean i'm with you with there's too many rainbows on on the page i also look i can't you can't see straight but yeah i mean I, I suppose along the way there are a few uh little tips and tricks on the technology side that could help keep things organized or like manage in an easier way and things that i hope You'll, you'll be able to carry through long thesis because these are these are some core yeah. skills that are going to guide you where wherever you go. Yeah, we're, we're, there's a question. Are you referring to managing? Yeah, we were managing the the track changes and comment boxes, and it's something that's really going to be the same set of skills we do uh, with a revise and resubmit when uh, uh, Renee's paper goes through peer review. It's going to be the same process that we actually ended up taking with your your, your supervisor because uh, that that's the way he liked to work and. Uh, that was really an important adaptation to 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 making that connection. I'm just gonna uh, highlight a couple more more comments. I think a lot of people are really feeling inspired by you, um, and, and I think this this does characterize your story too. Stop doing your best just because someone doesn't give give you credit. And and that there was a point there you knew what you had was good, and and you weren't getting that positive feedback. Um, 
and here another one, uh, uh, Brene, thank you for sharing your story. It's uplifting and, and motivational. Um, yeah, uh, Brene, do you have any, any, I think we're at a good point uh, to stop. Yep. I'm going to offer everybody, uh, Brene is in, in, in the Facebook group, in our community. So if you have any questions for Brene, uh, I'm taking the liberty here of saying reach out to Brene. Brene, which is your name on, on Facebook? What's it? Uh, is it Brene Dove or? Uh, no. I've got my husband's surname on there, Verne Savile. Um, just because I've been in, I've been on TV a little bit, and so I keep Savile so people don't always find me. Okay, <laughs> Savile, I'll, I'll pop that in the comments afterwards. But do reach out to Verne um, if you have any questions for her, um, and just thank you, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Uh, I mean, if you could do it, I really do believe that anybody can um, because you had all the odds stacked against you to get to where you are now uh, and really just really proud of the progress that you've made. Um, any, any last thoughts or things you want to share with the community too, Renee? Uh, I just think keep going, get that first chapter over the line. Really, once that first chapter's done, um, the others just followed really quickly. Like It's like once you know the recipe, you know the recipe. So that the most important thing is getting that first chapter over the line. And you'll see once you've done that, um, you'll just fly through the rest of it. So don't give up. Um, if people try and knock you down, don't give up. Believe in yourself, believe in your work and stand your ground. And all the best scientists in the world have stood their ground. 100%. Absolutely. And uh, Renee, thank you. you can see people are really thankful and grateful. And um, just to foreshadow for next week, we are going to have a member of our community, Philip Spiteri, who uh, is, is a medic, who's going to be talking to us about burnout, something that, Renee, you mentioned here in this session. Really, really excited to cover burnout cycle, some of the early warning signs and symptoms and what you can do about it. And uh, somebody even came in with a dolphin emoji for us. I didn't even know you could have a dolphin emoji. Uh, we're going to have to use that. We're going to have to use that here. Um, so, uh, yeah, we got other people saying stay, who stayed up late with us um, to stay on late in South Africa. Thank you. I'm going to leave us on this dolphin emoji. I'm from I'm, South I'm, Africa. You know there's a we dolphin emoji? I didn't know that was there. Um, <laughs> all right, Renee, let's, you, you and I, we'll, we'll, I'm going to end the stream. Bye, everybody. Renee, we're going to stay on for a second to, to chat about some of those publications. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend. <laughs>